chef de Pink Floyd, avec Rick Wright, organiste, Roger Waters, bassiste, et Nick Mason, batteur. If I can remember what it was that we were going to play next, I'd tell you, but I can't. So. Hello and welcome everybody to a new episode of our podcast called The Fingles Cave. In this episode, we have a very special guest who made a dream come true for Pink Floyd fans all over the world. Together with Gabe Pratt, he convinced Nick Mason in 2017 to create a super band to perform live not only any Pink Floyd music, but exactly those early songs, which for the bigger part have not been played after 1969. Obviously, I'm speaking about Mr. Lee Harris. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to have you on the show. That's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. So how are you? How are you? Everything's good? Yeah, good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go back out on the road. We're going to have uh, a couple of days rehearsal in July before we start. And that's about, what, I don't know, five, six weeks away. And then I'm moving. Uh, <laughs> then I'm moving uh, house. So staying in France, but moving about... 40 minutes north, a bit nearer to some cities, so I can do things like go and get some spices that you might not get in in your in, your, in the countryside uh, supermarket. You know, no, but um, um, yeah. So you know, a few things going on. So you're living in France for a whole, whole long. I've now? been here nine years. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great! It's a lovely place. To it's live. really it's, it is lovely, and um, um, you know, what, one of the things I really love having come from London is um you know in the winter it's still it's still light at five thirty, six o'clock at night you know whereas in england you sort of start getting dark about three o'clock or half three it starts getting <laughs> depressing you know but no no it's great it's still dark at 11 and it's getting dark at <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah so the first thing we always want to know i mean it's it's a pink floyd podcast mm -hmm. and what we like to do first, um, are you consider yourself being a, a big Pink Floyd fan? Yeah, I'd say I was, yeah. I mean, um, you know, my first memory of, of Pink Floyd is probably being at about, well, when did that Animals come out? 77. Yeah, Seven. so I would have been two years old listening to that album that my, you know, my parents were playing it and, you know, as it was an album, it was probably about as big as I was. So you know, I was looking at the photograph on the front and just hearing the animal noises and things like that, you know, for a kid, you know, I, li I liked all that. And then, um, and then when I was, um, I think eight or nine. So anyway, 19, I think it was 1980. We went to see, so I would have been, I would have been seven actually. Um, my parents took me to see Pink Floyd performing the wall at Earl's Court. So that, that, oh, really? that's a memory, you know, that I've, I've never forgotten. It's always been very vivid. Everything that happened in the show is always very vivid um, in my mind and probably is funny enough. It's something that Guy, our bass players, I'm sure everyone knows who Guy is, Guy Pratt. He always also still says to this day, it's the best, life thing he's ever seen you know I, I think it is for me as well um but yeah and i'm going past that you know when i when i took up guitar when i was 13 um i took it up primarily i got into it because i saw eric clapton come on as a special guest at a dire straits concert and that got me interested um even though my dad had brought me up listening to you know richie blackmore and and uh you know lots of pink floyd and santana and all that kind of stuff. It was seeing Clapton come on as a surprise guest that made me really think about playing guitar. And then once I got the guitar, you know, I was constantly listening to, to the wall and dark side of the moon. And, and I suppose then I would have, well, that would have been about 80, that was 86. So then, you know, the following year, momentary lapse came out. You know, so I was learning how trying trying to learn how to play things like on the turning away, and then I saw them live at Wembley Stadium, and and then at the Docklands Arena where they couldn't even get the, the screen in properly to fit because the, the the Docklands Arena wasn't tall enough. But um, you know, so what I'm trying to spit out is that you know, yeah, I I, I would say I'm, I'm a huge Floyd fan. Yeah, yeah, it's been 
all the way through my life, yeah. So um, did you only listen to the original albums or the few live recordings or did you also when, uh, get any bootlegs or... Sure, when, when um, before Delicate Sound of Thunder came out, I was interested in hearing... Um, you know, what, what they were, you know, obviously this is the days before the internet. So you couldn't even get a, a full complete set list of what was being played. So I'd hunt out, I'd go to a place in Kensington, London called Kensington market. And they used to have a lot of vinyl bootlegs then. So I'd get things from, um, I'm trying to think what I got there. I think I had one, I actually had a video that was, uh, from Madison square garden from the momentary lapse of recent year. I think it's oh, 87. Okay. I think it's 87 is, is that. And it's so I sort of I knew what they were playing and um and I've got some wall bootlegs then, you know. Um and I think I might have got you know one of those bootlegs that has a compilation of old BBC sessions and things. And you know yes. yeah, I did. I did. Quite yeah, yeah. So I, that's the sort of stuff I had. I didn't go Deep, you know, it didn't go deep, deep, but that's the sort of stuff I had. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same for me. It started with all the affairs, and and we had a flea market here yeah. in, uh, in Bonn, and I bought to so many very bad boots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, before the internet, as you say, before uh, communities like Yeshkul, there was just no bad, bad badly, to um, get any recent stuff. badly recorded or badly or bad in generation. Better generation, right, I would right, say, right. because most of them uh, later on we got a much much better uh, quality, yeah. got much much better shape. Yeah. By, because I, in the end it was Italian production. I don't know what generation it was. In sure, the end. sure, sure. So then you you worked your way backwards, or is it is it that uh, in the end everything after eighty seven interests you most? Um, I think I was at that age. I was just interested in what was current you know what was actually happening then mm. um and also because i was learning how to play guitar and listening to what david was doing then i was sort of just more interested in in that you know i remember going to camden market and getting a there's that um boot of the um division bell rehearsals where they i don't know where they are is it somewhere in america yeah hangar uh, and, yes, and and, and yes. so you know so I, i was trying to get decent sounding quality ones but the funny thing was at that point um you know my father had, had worked with storm thorgerson on and off so you know and i'd gone down when they were re when they were doing the reshoots on the high hopes video which would have been january 94 and you know i've told this story elsewhere but Uh, you know, st that was the first time I met Storm, and Storm said, "You know, are you, a, you know, are you a fan of David's?" And I said, well, "Yeah, he's, you know, he's one of my heroes." He said, "Oh, you know, would you like to hear the new album?" I was like, "Yeah, of course, I'd love to hear it." And he went here, and he gave me his keys to his car, and I ran off to his car, and there was a tape in the car that said, "Floyd Xmas Mix '93," and it was the Division Bell before it had been mixed. So I listened to it and about 40 minutes later, he came over and said, I, I didn't mean the whole thing. <laughs> so I, I, okay. I think he was more worried that I was going to run his car battery down than, than I was listening yes. to the whole album. Um, so, you know, I, I was... Did, did you, sorry, did you know already what you were listening to? Did you understand the... the... No, I mean, I, I put it on and, all, you know, I heard, you know, what we now know as Cluster One, but... Um, You know, things, you know, I say things had been mixed. I mean, I, I remember hearing, I mean, this is all lost in the sand of time, but I remember hearing another guitar solo on something that I, that isn't there now, but I don't remember what. I just remember when I heard the album, oh, that hasn't got that anymore, you know. It wasn't High Hopes because at that point I knew what High Hopes, I knew how that was because they used it to, for playback when they were, when they were filming. Mm. And actually, Uh, at that point, I know that half of the half of the lap steel solo was was on there. The second half of it hadn't been recorded yet, or at least hadn't been mixed into this tape anyway. So, um, you know, there were little things I noticed, but 
I was just sitting there with a big grin on my face. I couldn't believe it. But I, I do digress a bit here. That's not a bootleg. Um, you know, uh, I, but, but I, I, you know, but I, I do. Um, I just remember at that point, I was still, as I say, it's pre-internet, so you still couldn't get anything um, quickly. You know, you had to wait for it to be pressed and find it on a CD, and you know, whatever. So at a at at that time, did you uh, were you looking for any early material already, like seventish, early seventish material? Not really. I wasn't really going for that. That didn't really happen until until I had the idea for for the sources uh, you know, thing. But um, I'd hear things every now and then. I mean, I think that you know because people know that, or the the, the people who who know that I came up with the idea and went to Guy and then on to Nick, I think, and, and because my my idea was to focus on the early years, I think people have this idea that I'm some kind of early years Floyd freak, and, and I really am not, you know, I, the, the funny thing is, um, I, my original idea was that, um, uh, you know, you might, you maybe have this written down as a question to ask me, but, and I'm, and I'm already jumping the gun, but my, my original idea was that, um, was quite selfish really because I'd been here in my house in France my wife and I were were renovating and building the house I'd given up music for I didn't know when I'd when I'd do anything and I didn't know what it would be and I went to see David uh, uh, Gilmore in Orange and that was I think 2015 it was 2015 but i can't remember if yeah. if the album if rest of that lock had even come out yet i i can't remember i it was if i think it, it was, was it already, already out released. so so there were yes. there were some I, I don't think i even had it yet so so um i went to that gig really just to see guy you know and um it really propelled me back into wanting to play so and also to discover what it was that that david really did i mean obviously i knew that he always used a lot of delay in, in things at echo but but for my uh, uh you know when i was playing professionally it was always with this band called the blockheads who are an english band um you know not known everywhere outside of england but but um but really i would just plug straight into an amplifier with a bit of overdrive and and back the the uh the volume knob off on my guitar There was no, I never used any delay or anything. So, so the last sort of, I don't know, 12 years of my life playing guitar was really that. And I consigned all my effects pedals into a, you know, a basket somewhere, you know. So, so I was really getting into what David was using. And I had, um, you know, there, was, there were a lot of things on the net that you can use. There's obviously that, there's Bjorn's uh, Gilmoreish.com, which is fantastic. There's a, um, David Gilmore Gear Forum, which is just you know lot, lots of um, uh, different posts about different pedals and all this, you know, all nerdy stuff, but but very useful if you want to learn how he achieved different sounds. So I, I would use these things to find out what pedals to buy, and I did that for about a year, and then eventually I went to see them again in Nîmes, which is about another three hours from where I live. And I took my dad with me and we were sitting in, in the, um, in this sort of, you know, in this box opposite the stage. And we really, by that point I was really missing playing. And, and I was so enthused by hearing David's band and, you know, playing with the Floyd stuff as well, that I thought I'd really, really love to play some Pink Floyd stuff with Guy. And then I'm thinking, well, he's just not going to want to play all the stuff he does with with David. And then no, comfortably. You, oh God, you know, <laughs> oh God, you know. And then so, yeah. so then um, because I was in this amphitheater, it reminded me of Pompeii. And then I suddenly thought, well, actually, you know, set the controls, source a fall, you know. Um, I don't think David even played one of these days at that gig. I can't remember, but he might have done. But, you know, but there were, I just think it made me think of that era. And then, you know, and then at some point my thought went to, well, if I'm going to ask Guy, you know, maybe if we could get Nick involved, it would make it a bit more, 
what's the word you know not um you know give it some make it valid you know give it some validity you know yeah um, it converts it from a cover band to a super band. Yeah, but but it but it makes it something a bit more you know that you can take seriously as well. Like you know, who would come and watch me, who no one's heard of, playing with with Guy? You know what I mean? Who's who's not you know a a, a, a celebrity that would put bums on seats? In, you know? Do you know what I mean? So um, mm. it made me think. Well, if we did that, it has more of a you know Pink Floyd legacy thing and. At that point, there was, you know, we were, we were beginning to see a lot of um, bands with original members that you couldn't really call tribute bands. But, you know, like there was a David Bowie um, spin off group with Tony Visconti playing bass. And with, um, I've gone completely blank, the drummer from The Spiders from Mars. Um, and they were playing David Bowie songs that they'd recorded, you know, and uh, and then also some of his hits and things, you know, that they weren't on. But, you know, so there there were things like that. So that's... In the end, I mean, in the end, it's the same. Sorry. You know, so that's, that's when I, that was the, that was the idea. And then we went to, uh, you know, I, I said to Guy, you know, about, I don't know, a few days after I've had this idea and he said, it's a great idea, but he'll never go for it. And I went, all right. And I went off and I thought about it and, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And actually what happened was I, I, I spoke to my friend um, who used, who actually came up with the idea for this David Bowie band that I was just talking about. And he said, well, why don't you just, just completely focus on the early Pink Floyd of Sid Barrett? And I thought, yeah, do you know what? I'm not really a huge Sid Barrett fan. I don't know if I if I'd really enjoy playing that. And I went off and I thought, well, hold on a minute. Actually, what if I just concentrated just on early Pink Floyd up till seventy, you know, up to seventy three? And that's when I that's when I, it made more sense. And I went back to Guy and I said, listen, this is the actually the idea is we just do this period. How do I get it to him? And he said, okay, write it out properly. And then he sent it to, to Nick and I think it said something like, you know, this might be mad, but I thought you might, I thought you should see it. And it was my outline. And Nick replied, a, you know, three hours later saying, not mad, interesting. And then we had, as you said earlier on, we, we, uh, we met in 2017 and then that was it. You know. So, so did you, did you know Nick uh, at that time no, already I from your father? I didn't know him. I, I, um, I'd met him a couple of times, but it wasn't even, you know, okay. just like, you know, and, in and passing. When, when you had the idea of, when you had the idea of, of playing the um, most early songs, Sid Barrett songs and everything, uh, did you know by that time already that you would somehow meet the epicenter of the Pink Floyd fandom <laughs> that you just, no, hit it? no, I, I, I didn't realize. No, I, I didn't. I mean, the funny thing is, as you can probably tell from what I just said, you know, I, I, I didn't think of myself as being a bit Sid, Sid Barrett fan. I was kind of like, without wishing to sound rude, but I don't think any of them were here this anyway, a typical American who, who doesn't think Pink Floyd existed before Dark Side of the Moon, you know, or if they did, they think that like, that's all rubbish, you know. And once Nick actually said, oh, no, that's really interesting, I suddenly thought, oh, no, I'm now going to have to, go back and really, you know, listen to this stuff properly. And, when, and at that point, this is, you know, 2016, 17, um, I realized I actually really liked it, you know, and you start hearing it from, with a different, uh, with different ears, you know, because, and also um, it meant I didn't have to listen to Pulse for the thousandth time, you know, <laughs> I suddenly had all this other music open to me that I could listen to. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that I could, I could see once, once we were, once we had our first rehearsal and it sounded good to us, um, and I started having to look at what songs we could actually, um, you know, uh, perform, I could see actually there's a lot of these songs that haven't been played for a long time and, and it's great, you know, I know you know, the, the drums are not obviously a, 
a stringed instrument. You know, you don't think of them as melodic. Um, but playing with Nick is is quite. It's very different to playing with 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 other drummers because he he almost is just like another melodic instrument. You know, it's it's very yeah. You know, we will we will come right, to that right, later. Yeah. Yes, because it's very you very know. special. But, yes. but um. Okay. Yeah, go on, go on. I, I, you'll find this with me. <laughs> Everyone listening will get really annoyed because I, I tend to free associate quite a no, lot. No, no, it's most it's it's most yeah. most interesting, but I uh, I fear to to miss some cues. <laughs> no um, worries. So so at that point when you started um, listening to the very old stuff, um, did you only listen to the official albums, or did you already start listening to some unofficial recordings or concerts? Both, both completely both. Um, Really, I think what I was doing was I'd listened to the original um, takes, original you know, releases. And once I knew that we would be playing, let's say, for instance, I don't know. Um, okay, let's pick a song like Childhood's End, you know, so like we'd know that. And then but then you'd find a live recording and hear that they suddenly go off and start playing a cream song, don't they? I've forgotten what one it is. Um, you know, mm. Nick was talking to me about it. But we were going to do that, but then we eventually were like, no, we don't want to copy exactly. Like, then it is almost like being a tribute band if you're doing stuff like that. But yeah, I think you, know, you did your own instead of yeah, well, Overdrive. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, instead of Overdrive, although there, I don't think there aren't that many versions of Interstellar of Overdrive out there, are there? Mm. But, um, um, but what I would do is, you know, I, I would take... Once I knew we were going to be doing a specific song, I'd then go back and see if there are any live versions of it to see if there are any parts that they did. Actually, I'll tell you what's a really good example is Atom Heart Mother, because you could, you know, I, I could, we actually sat down, the five of us, in a room and decided which sections of Atom Heart Mother we thought would be, would work best live for us. So once we worked out what bits we were going to do, uh, I would go off and sort of go, well, hold a minute. Uh, the first guitar solo that I'm playing, which is on the slide, um, I knew, for instance, that David had played that a few years back in London with Juan Giesen. So I thought, well, Correct. well, so I'd, so I'd listen to that and think, well, I'm quite interested in playing it how he might play it if he was playing it now. So I, So actually what I do now is a composite of little bits of what he did there coupled with something I think from a might be from a BBC session where there are overdubbed slide parts. So Gary and I lapse into that. And then when we go back into, um, um, uh, funky dog, you know, that, that isn't taken from anything. That's just us jamming, you know? So, It's kind of like, I think, you know, I kind of treat, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to speak for the other guys, but certainly for me with, with the songs, I would take um, the, the original release as a kind of demo and then say, well, that, this is it. This is where the verse, chorus and, you know, everything else is. But then what have they done in the past? And if, they, and if I like some, one version better than another, I will probably incorporate that into what I'm playing, you know. So, and, the, and listening, it's, it's, uh, sorry, Nils, but but listening to the yeah. to these older bootlegs uh, was very helpful for that. Yes, because it's it's, it's funny funny that you say that because um, your versions of of these songs are much more similar, or let's call it a recent, updated, wonderful version of the original way they were playing it live, nice, yeah. not, not as a studio That's album. nice to hear, yeah. I mean, and um, yeah. and Atomhood Mother, I mean, uh, not too many people are liking the original album and it's a bit outdated. It's in comparison to metal, for example, it seems to be a little bit off nowadays, yeah. but the, the old live version, there are so many wonderful live well, they, versions uh, they, it, in it's, 1970 yeah. and 72. It's, it's, more, it's more rocking and it, it's rawer, isn't it? It just sounds, you know, it sounds... You can hear that it's Pink Floyd. You know, it, it's it's you know that they're work, they're all working off of each other, playing together. It's great. So, so when you when you started working with all the uh, old titles in the Sid Barrett era and seventy seventy one, 
was there any moment where you thought this this might go very wrong because uh, i mean these these pink floyd fans might be a special hood no i never i mean i i, I don't know if people ever think about that sort of stuff i mean i um no i mean you're talking to the guy who the day after dingwalls saw lots of reviews in the broadsheets you know in the, in the newspapers in in england and hadn't even thought about the fact there were going to be reviews you know i i'd so i didn't really think about any anything like that i i think that you know um we'd you know if if nick thought it was good and was happy with it and guy did you know and yeah. they, and you know that was good enough for me you know um i don't, i wasn't really thinking about anything else i think it's that it's that old cliche that that, that musicians always say you know you, you you have to do it for yourself you know you have to be happy with it and then it doesn't matter so i think there was the confidence was there that that me being a big pink floyd fan if i thought it was good I'm, i knew other people would enjoy it you know yeah i remember uh reading the first uh, news about mm. it uh, about the mm. band about you and guy pratt doing it and i remember that we were all uh, really really excited right, about it right right But at the same time, we uh, of course we feared that it might be another cover band yeah. doing whatever cover sure, bands are sure. doing. But it is in the end, and it always was. It was uh, totally, totally opposite. I mean, I was in, in Oberhausen in 2018, mm -hmm. I think, first row, and I was just I mean I almost cried <laughs> because it was so different. Yeah. And I've I've been to many Roger Waters concerts, David Gilmour concerts. And also Pink Floyd. I saw Pink Floyd live in Cologne in, in 89, oh, yeah. I think, and in 1994. Sure. But, um, and that's something everybody I know is really, uh, they love you about that because it's so close to the original mm. feeling mm. that Pink Floyd creates. And that's something really fantastic. I suppose, the, you know, yeah, I think when you go and see huge shows, um, it, it's difficult especially when people are on a big stage and they've got their own monitors in front of them, it's difficult for them to interact, you know, and also as, as time progresses, you know, I suppose that players finesse their parts down to a T, you know? Um, so I, I think with us, you know, you can see us looking at each other. You can see if someone makes a mistake, someone else laughs or, Or whatever's going on, you can see us all looking at each other yeah. and playing, playing each other. But yeah, I mean, I think going back to yeah, what you were just saying before that, I mean, I think it's you know we're reinterpreting, we're not recreating, we're reinterpreting. Um, and you know, if we were if we were recreating, it kind of would be you know it would be a, a cover band, a tribute band, you know. And 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 I don't want to talk too much about Guy Pratt, but. Um... We, we all knew and why not told us <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. <laughs> um, no the, the funny thing is that that we all knew that guy pratt loves pink floyd yeah. he loves david gilmore and everything yeah. but uh he also told the stories about having a sofa on the back of the stage sitting with Nick <laughs> yeah, Mason yeah. in between songs or during songs yeah. because there was so much going on but not music mm -hmm. and and he, he must be so so happy about doing what he can do right now and if i watch the contest and i was as i said in oberhausen and then again in rome which was just a wonderful mm. night in an open auditorium as you know yeah. <laughs> um and and seeing him uh, playing his bass guitar the way he wants to and just turning back to nick supporting nick sometimes mm -hmm. with the cues yeah. and everything and and his uh, little remarks about the nile song yeah 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 just, yeah Put, put it all together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, so um... absolutely. And I remember when we came off, um, when we, actually the day that all those reviews came out that I was talking about, I remember getting to the to the Half Moon in Putney for our second show, and I, I was the first one there, and um, Nick turned up, and I said, have you seen the reviews? And he said, you know, I, I couldn't have written them better myself, you know. And um, <laughs> And I said to Nick, I knew what's happened was going to happen which is that I knew that people would suddenly go, oh, my God, Gary Kemp can play guitar. Because it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> like, it's like, what do you think he's been doing for the last 40 years? But, but of course, you know, Nick said to me, you know, the thing is that when people think of, of new romantics, they don't think of music. They think of clothes, you know. 
So it's, 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 it, especially in England, you know, you, people think of new romantics and they do think of all that kind of, uh, you know, early eighties, what they're, all the outfits and things. But no, I mean, Gary, Gary's a phenomenal guitar player, you know, and, it, and it's, and it works really well. We, we actually met up before, before the band actually got together. We were the first two to actually play together just to make sure we got on musically. We already knew each other, you know, we, we, we weren't great friends, but we knew each other. Um, and, you know, and, and that worked out really well. You know, we, we, we work, I mean, I, I was used to playing with, with another guitar player. He wasn't, but because I was used to it, I made it, I could make it easy for him to do it. You know, he'd be like, what are you going to be doing when I'm here? And I said, I, I won't be there. I'll be at the other end of the neck with a different inversion. Don't worry about it. And, you know, he didn't, he never had to worry about what I was doing and vice versa. So it was good. So, um, working with a complete band just seems to be a joy. Tom Bacon is a wonderful keyboard. I mean, everything yeah, yeah. just works very well. And um, one specific thing I would like to know, um, Nick Mason, we, we mentioned it already, but I mean, he's just, he seems to be just a lovely guy and it's uh, being a Pink Floyd member, it's not easy, I would say. I mean, David Gilmour and Roger Waters, we shouldn't talk about that, <laughs> that their fight and everything. And they, they both seem a bit grumpy these days and um, having that wall through Twitter and everything, having Paul. Well, they, Paul they, they, maybe, they're, involved, they're, it's so maybe they're grumpy, you know, with each other, but I don't think they're particularly, you know, I mean, I've, I've met, I've met both of them and they weren't, they weren't grumpy to me, you know, when I met them, you know what I mean? You know, okay. That's great yeah. to know. <laughs> that's yeah. great to know. So, but back to, to, to Nick Mason, I mean, it's, um, it's, as you said, the way he plays the drums is something very special. And, and, uh, for me personally, uh, astronomy domine in the mm -hmm. way the drums there are so, and it's, it's funny that you said it's a very melodic way of playing mm. it because a friend of mine who doesn't uh, know Pink Floyd very well, he's my best friend, but he, he uh, went m with me to all the concerts, mm -hmm. not knowing one single song. Poor boy. Still <laughs> not knowing one single yeah. song, but he loved both concerts. Great. And, uh, Laura, Laura, Laura yes. Lai, the um, festival, we, it's the uh, same sure, sure. I, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I will go cool. with. And he's already looking forward to it. And, and he's, he told me, Astronomy Domini, every single time it's so great. And, and the drums are so yeah. great. And somehow the mixing on the live shows, is um, the, the drums are so, I wouldn't say aggressive, mm. but up front, yes. it's really lovely. The only band I, I, I could think of where, where it's almost the same is Emerson Lane Palmer. Oh, Palmer. yeah. Palmer is also yeah. a real member of the band yeah. doing his sure, part. Sure, sure. So, um, so how was it when you decided, okay, let's, let's go to, uh, let's book a room um, and yeah. start playing? It's funny because actually Guy and Gary have told in the past that the first song we played together was Interstellar Overdrive, but it wasn't. I've got the emails where I told everyone what we were going to play on the first day. And it was the first thing we actually all played together was Astronomy Domini. Um, uh, but, um, I think the first time in that, you know, that I realized, I don't know, try and think, pick my words carefully, you know, but, but it was, I suppose when I realized how special Nick was really was when we played set the controls. And I realized that all he was doing was going dum, da, dum, 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 da, dum, dum. And when you watch, anyone in a tribute band doing it. They don't, they never get it right. They never do, or maybe they're not trying to get it right, but they never do what he did, what he does. And that's when I was like, yes, that is Nick Mason, you know? And it's funny because I think that's probably, I think he always says it's his favorite Pink Floyd song. I don't know if it's necessarily his favorite Pink Floyd song to play, but I know it, he says it's his favorite Pink Floyd song, but you know, that's, it is a really special, uh, you know, bit of percussion that he, he does on that. And also then he, of course, he then gets quite thunderous with his, with his double uh, bass drums, you know, when, when the solos go off, uh, there's a lot of um, light and shade in that song, you know, uh, it's not just a pure out, out rock and roll tune, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was special. I think by the end of that, by the end of that um, uh, get together, you know, we realized that we had something that, that was something that we all enjoyed doing, you know, 
and then we had another rehearsal and it actually came together very quickly i think we had i think we had two i think we had i'd have to check my diaries but i think it was something like it might have been three rehearsals and then we had a um what do you call it like a showcase so we had um management tour management lighting company you know brit row came down sound company and friends and family came so we could actually have an audience and and um that was in january so that we had rehearsal before that and then we had the showcase and then and then we decided right we're gonna you know i mean obviously our agent john giddings came down and then that was it we had we had the the uh um, half moon the dig and half moon gigs booked and they were putting in the european tour uh, obviously at the same time for september um but it was um it moved very quickly from that first time in the rehearsal room it was it would have been what october november december january showcase february march april may you know it was very quick for a, a band to to get together you know yeah yeah so um we we talked uh, briefly about uh, Roger Waters and David Gilmour. Yeah. Roger Waters joined you in New York yes. at a very special night yeah. and supported you on set the controls for the Out of the yeah. Sun. So um, how was it for you? Because for us, uh, there's a video on YouTube and it's yeah. a wonderful version and it's uh, it's outstanding. It's um, well, it was obviously it's obviously fantastic when the, the person who wrote you know the material likes what you do you know that that's fantastic um when Roger came down it was quite it was a funny one because um I don't even remember ever being told that it was a possibility that he would and on the day I had a I had someone send me a social media message saying is it true Roger Waters is performing with you tonight which I ignored because I don't tend to answer people I don't know you know asking me questions that I would never answer anyway, you know, and that, but that was the first time I thought about it. And I was like, I wonder why that person's asking that question. And then I got to sound check at the beacon. It would have been about five thirty, six o'clock. And I went on stage just to check my gear and a tour manager came over and said, uh, production manager, I should say, came over and said, Oh, Nick, Nick wants to see you upstairs. And I thought, that's weird. He's never, he, no, he's never done that. Like, you know, can you come and see me? Oh, that's weird. So I went up and actually all the bands were in the dressing room and, um, Nick said, Roger's going to join us tonight. And I burst out laughing. So yeah, right. You know, and he said, no, no, he is. And I went, <laughs> and then just laughed. And then Gary looked at me and said, no, no, he is. Cause they realized I thought it was a joke. I said, Oh, all right. You know, cause it's now like, 6 15 or so and the show starts in two hours i was like well you know what happened was that rogers um roger had had lost his mobile phone and didn't know nick's phone number i suppose didn't know his email address without looking at it you know um and wasn't able to reply to nick who had asked him would you like to come and do something so um he finally got hold of him at about six o'clock that night when the the cab driver where he left his phone with uh, managed to get it back to him. And so we, we, when he, he turned up at about, I think it was about 15, about 20 minutes before we went on stage. And um, we told him, we, you know, he, I think he'd pick set the controls. So we didn't even get to run through it with him. We just told him what we did. Like, you know, the, the Gary does a solo, I do a solo, then, it goes down and you know whatever um so we all met him before and then the, the really what i remember about that gig apart from the fact that my family were there uh but you know my sister and my parents um was that when we started playing opposite me was one of the exit doors back out into the into the lobby and roger was standing behind the whole audience at the exit door watching it with a big smile on his face while we're playing Interstellar Overdrive and Astronomy Domini. That was really funny. And then our tour manager went and, you know, went with him and took him around the back. So 
the whole of the audience is sitting there not knowing that Roger's standing behind them watching, you know. Um, and then when he came on, yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was it was rather funny because you know they Nick calls me the professor because I like to know if the band have ever played at a certain venue we're playing before, or you know, so it's yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so he calls me the professor. So he asked me that night, you know, when when did I first play in New York? And I told him it was nineteen sixty seven, and he said, no, I don't think it was. And I was like, and I was thinking. Well, why did you bloody ask me then? You know, if you knew what it was. So anyway, so so um, what happened was when Roger came out, um, you know, we had the joke that that you know that, that Nick tells about how you know he never got to play the gong, and then of course the lights went down and Roger came out and took the mallet from him. Um, so that was all a big joke, and then Roger came out and you know did his you know walk across the stage saying hi to the audience. And then he went up to the microphone, looked at me in the eyes and said, I remember it well, it was 1969. And I was like, what? You know, so he's come out and he's telling me I'm wrong, you know. And then um, I thought, there's no way that Pink Floyd first played in New York in 1969. And I actually text Andrew King, who, who was one of the managers of the Floyd back in 67 when Sid was around. He told me, no, they never played in 67, but it would have been 1968. So I was wrong and Roger was wrong. <laughs> it was actually 1968. But um, yeah, no, it was it was really, it was, you know, it was obviously a special occasion. You know, um, something like that is always going to get a lot of people talking. Um, you know, I suppose in a way it's a, uh, well, not in a way. I mean, it, it's a reunion of Pink Floyd of sorts, you know. Um, and um, I think it's probably the last one we've had for a long time. I don't think we've had any... You know, David hasn't played with Nick with us. David hasn't obviously not played with Roger, so that is the last I one we've had. Two, oh two. Yeah, the, the one before that was the last Waters. one. So, so the last time any yeah. Pink Floyd members have played together, or you know, um, original members, would, would that must be it at the, at the moment? Um, yeah. But um, you know, I remember we got off stage and you know it was all over the internet already. You know, it was so it was it was quite a you know a cool thing to be part of. Yeah, yeah. So did you did you meet Roger backstage? I met him before the show. Um, I gave him a hug during the show <laughs> when he walked off. I decided not to go up and have a chat with him after the show because um, I thought, you know what, I've really enjoyed that. I don't want to. You know, I know he could. I could yeah, don't he, yeah, he could be. A, he can be prickly, and I didn't want to encounter that. Not that I thought I would, but I thought I might. You know. I don't know yeah. why, so I, I didn't. Um, but I also did have, as I said, my my sister and her family and my parents had come all the way there, so I needed okay. to spend time with them. Um, but no, it was it was. Yeah, I thought I thought about uh, Guy Pratt because he. I, I know that that something happened. Uh, Life Aid that uh, Richard Wright uh, somehow mentioned to uh, Roger Waters that. Um, Guy Pratt would play the bass this way at this song. And oh yeah, that was that. That was that thing. Harshly yeah. said, yeah, I don't care what your what, yeah, your yeah. Son well, you know, I, I, things could, things are said in, you know, in jest or in the heat of the moment. But I mean, I you know, all I know is that you know, don't forget that Guy did actually play with Roger um, at that benefit concert that he played with David. You know, what Guy was playing at that True. as well. So there was no, you know, there's no bad blood between them. You know. Okay, great, great. So I would like to to talk with you about another show. Mm. Looks like oh, yeah. 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how. At, at one. Well, I was going to say I don't. I, mean, I don't know how we fit on the yeah. stage. Is that what you were going to say? No. <laughs> It's a pace. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, before we start to talking about that that concert, I mean, uh, for for anybody who might not know. Um, the last song, Source Full of Secrets, yeah. um, uh, was performed by the audience, yeah. at least the Celestial, Celestial Voices. voices. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I, I still can't listen to it without getting goosebumps and always, always same here. start here. Absolutely same here, same here, yeah. It's, um, it's, it, it's so special in so many ways because it, it, it proves, uh, it strongly proves how happy everyone is that you do yeah. that 
and it's it's the perfect bridge between the the very old songs and the i mean us as being big pink floyd fans we are mostly live in the in the past and and we try to research and find old audience recordings and sure. some people are remastering it and it's it's almost always something being 50 years off or 60 years and what happens when 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 one is on a concert from nick mason's source flow secrets it's there's a perfect bridge between that time and now and having an audience uh, audience a room full of full of people who are not just capable but able to sing the whole part mm -hmm. is so special and uh, if you then listen to the whole concert uh, the complete concert is something so special because as guy uh, mentions if i remember correctly that when they had to be quiet they were quiet when they had to be <laughs> enthusiastic they were yeah. so was it a special night for you too? it um very really difficult to answer this without maybe upsetting people. I, I don't really enjoy shows where the stage is like, you know, like the first gigs we did, Dean Wars and Half Moon. Dean Wars was, was okay. Half Moon was tiny. And this was like that. And you're right on top of your amplifier. So you can't have it as loud as you want. So you can't get the feedback you want in certain songs. Um, it's very hot in there. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, we, I've got a fan, but it was still so hot. But what gets you through a show like that is when you have an audience like that. And the audience, as you say, I mean, like, what I can see up the front is just people totally, you know, just, you know, you, you, euphoric, you know, they're so happy. They're hearing these songs. Um, and you, you often, you're not, you know, you're not that close, especially when you're playing in a theater and you've got, I don't know, maybe um, where there might be an, a, a, an orchestra pit in front of you. So you have an even, you know, more of a distance between you and the front row, even in some of the small theatres we play in. So, so it basically is what is special about those sort of shows that you're talking about um, are the fact that you're that close to the audience. Um, and what happened in Celestial Voices, no one, we weren't expecting that because that had never happened anywhere before. And it never happened anywhere again until we played a Den Atelier again, you know, um, last year, you know. Yeah. Um, and last year, they, the audience knew that they had to really go for it. So, you know, and, and I was ready for it. And I took my, my in-ear monitors out so I could hear it properly. First time we played there, we didn't have in-ear monitors. So it, it was a real shock for us because, uh, you know, we, we could hear them, the audience immediately. You know, it was, it was fantastic. But yeah, yeah. Um, it is the audience that, that makes those things special. Yeah. So talking about special concert, concerts, um, you're going to Pompeii this year. Yes, in yes, summer. yes, yeah. So this will be the first time Echoes being played at Pompeii. Yeah, I mean, don't forget since the, the original. Pompeii. Yeah, but don't forget, you know, we are, you know, we we're about a mile down the road from where it was, where it was filmed, you know, and where David show was. So it's not exactly the same place, you know. <laughs> but obviously, you know, it's a bit like Wembley Stadium isn't no longer where Wembley Stadium used to be. So it's a, it's a similar kind of thing to that. But yeah, I mean, I think obviously this shows, um, I should think that Pompeii is just in, you know, every Pink Floyd fan who knows more than another brick in the wall. You know, they, 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 know, they know about Pompeii. You know. I think we sold it out in about, a day or a day or two, I think it was sort out, which is quick, you know, very quick for us outside of outside of England. You know. um, and then you're going to Australia for the first time, yes. which is lovely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, long way to go. Uh, but um, yeah, again, I think, you know, they probably starved of having. Oh, well, I suppose Roger goes over there. I don't know the last time David is David ever been there. I don't think he has. Uh, no, I wouldn't say yeah, so. so. Maybe Sydney, yeah, maybe. Melbourne, no, I don't. But not latest tours. I no, I say. mean, I know Pink Floyd, when he was in Pink Floyd, they were there in 89, yeah. maybe, or 88, 88, maybe. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah, I'm sure that, you know, um, um, you know, whenever we play, we always, I don't think I've ever, we've ever done 
anything that I'd recall, like we've had a bad night or anything. We always, you know, we always try and put on the best show we can. So hopefully we'll please a lot of people who haven't seen anyone from Pink Floyd for a long time. So will will there be any any surprises after? I mean, Echoes wasn't really a surprise because it's called the Echoes. Yeah, tour, exactly. But in the end, yeah. <laughs> playing Echoes is a wonderful thing. Will there be any? No, we, no. I mean, uh, this Netflix? is still the Echoes tour, so we, we'll just be playing what we've played okay. on, you know, on the Echoes tour. I mean, I don't know if we'll. Um, yeah, I think we stopped playing. We stopped playing Interstellar Overdrive. I think about sort of halfway through the Echoes tour, uh, primarily because we had, I think we realized that what was happening was that um, we do set the controls for the heart of the sun. And then it gets to the, to the part where Dom and Gary do a big sort of breakdown and Gary's doing all his, you know, twiddling all his bits And then we go, and then we go off and come back and do instead of overdrive, and then Gary just starts twiddling all his bits again. So it's kind of like doing two things in the same, you know, one after the other, where the same thing's happening. So we decided to to cut that. But I quite like to put a bit of interstellar overdrive back in. I quite miss. I think I think the set misses that riff, you know, at least you know yeah. it misses that bit of Sid, and especially because the film, the Sid films, just come out. Um, I think it'd be good to have it back in the set, or some of it anyway. Maybe not, as, maybe not a six-minute version, but we'll do it. But no. yeah, it was a great opening. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of these days is also great. But, yeah. Um... Um, I think Interstellar Overdrive was, was what was good about having that was it, it set, it told the audience this is what we're doing, you know. And whereas one of these days was just like, well, we didn't really want to go back on doing exactly the same order of songs, but one of these days I kind of feel is something that we from playing that era of Pink Floyd, you kind of have to do it. So it's good to get rid of it earlier on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny thing. I had a discussion with uh, uh, some of my friends here, Pink Floyd fan friends, and uh, it's 50-50. Some of them just say, yeah, I can't listen to one of these days sure. anymore. It's a, it's a rock version of Wish You Were yeah. Here. But I have to admit, um, I, I still love in a, every single version. I, I yeah, like, I mean... I, I can listen to it all yeah, day. Yeah, I like, you know... I. I do like the the early versions where it was a bit more raucous before um, it became more of a bluesy thing, you know, or not bluesy, but like, you know, I suppose David would play more of a blues solo, you know, and the early ones. It's funny because I remember I, I copied very close to the record, to the actual metal version on the um, on our first tour and on the on the live at the Roundhouse. That's very close to that. I think I might only put in like eight bars difference you know and I remember reading online someone saying I can't stand the way Lee Harris you know just uh, improvises I was like no you obviously haven't listened to the you've obviously <laughs> been listening to the Pulse version for the last 30 years and not listened to the original one that's what I'm doing you know, it's one of the few um, you know one of the few parts of the set where I kind of do copy what um, what David did you know um originally um but then again there you go that's kind of like why you can't really listen to what people say because you've got to do what you want to do you know did you ever consider putting in on a set list putting in a, one of your own compositions or anything off pink no um i think you know some people have said you know why don't you play some solo sid stuff but you know Nick's not on any of that. I don't think that's, you know, it's Nick's name on the marquee. I don't really think there's much point mm -hmm. in doing things like that unless Nick said, why don't we do that? But I don't think Nick, that's, I think that's something Nick would think about doing. Um, I think there's plenty of other songs from the early years that if we are going to do anything again, there are still other songs we can still attempt and maybe, you know, time to maybe get rid of some of the ones we're doing, you know. Um, But I don't know. I mean, we haven't had any discussion about, um, you know, even writing our own material. I mean, I, I can understand why people ask if we would do that. And I think it would be interesting to hear what we might do. But what would you do? Would you have to write a kind of song in the style of Sid Barrett? That would just be weird, you know. So 
you know, or a song in the style of 1968 Pink Floyd. It, you know, then if you don't do that and you do something you do now, it might sound totally different to all this other stuff that we play, all the other Pink Floyd stuff. So, yeah, totally. so I, I don't really know. I think that um, if we were ever going to do anything like that, I think it would be if we got asked to do music for a movie or, you know, a video game or a TV show or something like that. I, I don't think you know, we'd, we'd be, um, uh, you know, I don't think we'd be looking at recording our own album and then going out and playing that album and then some Pink Floyd songs, I think. But, but uh, you know, yeah, I, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but it doesn't seem right. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a monster you created yourself <laughs> because, as I said before, you created a bridge between the, the early 60s or late 60s mm. and, and nowadays. And of course, I totally get you and I totally understand what uh, everything you would do might be mm. wrong because they're expecting something they know, but don't yeah, know yeah. it. Yeah. But I think asking for an, a, a new composition or songs by your own is, is the nicest thing to ask yeah, for. Absolutely. Because yeah, absolutely. Yeah. really trust you as a band yeah. in, in, in creating something which is... Pink Floydish, but your yeah. own, so yeah. to speak. But I understand that it's. I think that to achieve is almost impossible. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But who knows? I mean, I never thought I'd be doing this. So you know, I never thought I'd be in this band. So you never know what's around the corner. <laughs> you know. The only th uh, the only thing I can say is please don't stop <laughs> playing live. It's uh, it's just wonderful. Thank you. Everything that came up so Thanks. far is just great and thank you very much for taking your time and it was a lovely cool. chat very nice and thank you all for listening this was our latest episode of fingles cave podcast and we will have another another special guest next episode thank you very much for listening and have a good night a good day or whatever you do bye bye <laughs>